Good morning, church family. I hope you've all had a good week. This week, I thought it would be good to slowly get back into the swing of things. And so I'll be bringing the message to you this morning, albeit um, remotely on the internet. I want to speak to you today on something I've been reflecting on during my time of rest. That area is actually God's timing. I think you would agree with me that it's an area that we often have questions about, especially in our faith journeys. You know, how does God operate in time? How does he see time? Why is it that God's perfect timing is often so different from our idea of perfect timing? Sometimes God's timing seems to make total sense. And at other times we wonder, why has God allowed things to happen in a certain way and at a certain time? You could really go on, the questions are vast. So as we enter a new year, I want to begin my teaching this year on this important subject. Because I firmly believe that if we can grasp how God sees time, it will help us in our faith journeys. So let's begin. Firstly, time is something that God created, but he does not depend on. You see, God is outside of time and does not need time to operate. So if God doesn't need time, then why did he create it? Well, one reason I believe is to give structure to his creation and a mechanism in which his created ones are to function and live. Right from the start in scripture, we read from Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So God created time with a beginning, and so it must follow that time has an ending as well. Time provides a routine and structure for all of creation. Creation has a beginning and an end. We have a beginning and an end. But time is not just like an unused set of bookends. A lot happens in between. There is comfort and safety in time. You know what to expect. There is routine. We often say that children need routine to thrive. Did you know that God invented that concept first? As God's children, we know how many hours are in the day when morning will come, when night will come, what order the seasons take, spring, summer, autumn and winter. Time is set up to ensure that life is sustainable, that the cycle of life continues, that crops are harvested and that the soil has time to rest, that people are born and grow from childhood to old age. We can learn a lot about God's character from the way he created this world, establishing it using time. For example, God is precise and ordered. You will never hear of two nights in a row or winter coming directly after spring. And as much as we would like it, you don't get younger with time. God has a process by which the world functions seamlessly day after day, month after month, decade after decade, even century after century. It is within time then that we live out our existence. Time starts for us when we are born and ends when we die. Every generation that has ever lived follows this pattern. Ecclesiastes 3 says, There is a time for everything, and the season for every activity under the heavens. 
a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Now, while we should know the rhythms of time, we are often surprised by it. We say, boy, time sure did fly by. Or we might say, I can't believe this. Time is going so slow today. But what if instead of thinking of time as we usually do, we learn to anticipate the flow of God's time? What if we understood that better so they would that we were less taken by surprise and more able to operate in God's time more effectively. To begin with, one important fact we need to come to grips with then is that time for us is not the same as time is for God. 2 Peter 3, 8 to 9 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God's timing is different from our understanding of time, the scripture tells us. But this does not make God slow. God will fulfill all his promises. You see, God's timing also takes into account his desired outcome or will. Have you ever had to manage the needs of a group of people and try to keep them all happy and safe? It's a tough task for us humans, especially as we don't know what is good for us half the time. Not that God needs help. He can manage just fine. Only the Creator is capable of such a task over the course of all time. His will is that we all should be given the chance to come to repentance. In other words, the chance to come to know God in relationship. That is His top priority. And yet, He still cares for each of our needs and desires too. He will get to that in time, in His good and perfect time. But that is not his priority. We often mistakenly think that God is impatient with us, when actually we are the ones that are impatient with God. Let's all try to learn some patience and realize how privileged we actually are, that God gives each one of us the time we need to get to know him, to make the choice to follow him. And before those of you who are naturally gifted in time management lose the will to live, God also knows that if we had endless time, we would leave things up to the last minute. How many of us procrastinate in areas in our lives that we should be putting in the effort for? God knows us better than anyone, and so God puts a limit on our time and on creation's time. Because ultimately, he wants to move us out of time and into eternity. Another important lesson for faith. Are we using the time we have in honor of God and to work out our faith? Let's take the example of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. Have you ever thought about that story from the perspective of time? How do you think Abraham would have reacted if he knew ahead of time what God would do? 
Would he have strived to be as faithful as he was? If he knew God would provide the sacrifice, would he have tried as hard as he did to be obedient? You know, we often read that portion of scripture where God finally does provide a sacrifice and we sigh with relief. Wow, God came through just in the nick of time, we say. But is that actually true? Have you ever considered the fact that God's timing is perfect and doesn't come too late? He is not slow, as Peter told us in the verses above. And clearly it is not like the lamb showed up 10 minutes after Abraham had actually killed Isaac and God said, oops, I'm sorry, I was kind of stuck in traffic. No, actually God was right on time, on perfect time, with the best outcome in mind. You see, Abraham's belief in God's promises proved correct. Why would God promise him descendants through Isaac and then break this promise? And you know what? I bet Isaac learned that God always had his good in mind, even when it didn't seem that way. God provided the ultimate sacrifice. Does that sound familiar to you? If God was right on time for Abraham and right on time for Isaac, he will also be right on time for you. Paul writes in Romans 5, 6 to 8, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proved his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has showed up for us in a really big way, and it won't be the last time either. You know what amazes me about God's timing? When you are privileged to catch a glimpse of it and see how intricately he has woven situations and people together in such perfect harmony, it truly is a beautiful thing to behold. You know, just last week, we attended the opening of the music studio. For those of you not familiar with our church, Lost by Design Records has its premises here in our church building. God not only put this church and the music studio together so that we might be a blessing to each other, but he also brought together many musicians to use the gifts God has given them in a profound way. There are some musicians connected to our church and some are from outside, yet all are a part of his kingdom. God's perfect timing has created a multifaceted situation that only God could have brought together so perfectly and so wonderfully. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So what have we learned about God's timing compared with ours? God's timing is precise and ordered. There is no rush, but likewise, there's also no delay. It's perfect all the time because God is perfect and can perfectly weave his willful creation into something beautiful, despite the circumstances. God is always on time for us even when it feels he might not be. At the right time, he saved us. At the right time, he will make all things beautiful. So now that we have a basic understanding of God's timing, how does it inform our lives and our faith journeys? Well, we've learned that God's timing has purpose. Its ultimate goal is repentance and growth. But not any growth. It's growth in Christ's likeness. Something time and us alone can never accomplish. There are things that time cannot fix. And so God, who is outside of time, entered time to save us 
and to show us how to live in his time. More importantly, how to live with a kingdom time mindset. You see, Christ enables us by his grace and mercy to repair the relationship we have lost with God when sin entered the world. The limited time we had and the harshness of its reality, you know, separation from God and death was broken. We have been ushered into a unique opportunity with not only the promise of eternity with God before us, but we have the privileged opportunity of being formed into the likeness of Christ to become people known for being children of God. Children who participate in what God is already doing, spreading the good news and the peace and joy and fulfillment that only living in kingdom times brings. So how can we honor God for what he's done for us and make the most of the time we have? Dallas Willard says in his book, Renovation of the Heart, Putting on the Character of Christ, that this eternal kind of life we have now inherited is not a passive life, a life without action. It is a life that demands action and gratitude for all that God has done for us. He uses the example of the Israelites about to cross over into the promised land as an example. Dallas says that the first obstacle they had to face is Jericho. And here they see God act in a mighty way. The walls come tumbling down, not by their own effort, but through God's mighty power and in his perfect time. The Israelites have crossed over the line, so to speak. They are in the promised land. But it is a time of now and not yet for them, as they have much more conquering to do before the promised land is theirs in its entirety. Can you see how it's a metaphor or a symbol of the place we now find ourselves in? We too live in the now and not yet. So what did the Israelites do next? Dallas says they had a lot of conquering to do by careful, persistent and intelligent human action over a long period of time. It's like that expression, good things take time. This is something we see less and less of in a world driven by instant gratification. Instant gratification is the desire to experience pleasure or fulfillment without delay or deferment. Basically, you can have it when you want it. Can you see how having that mindset is in direct opposition to God's timing? The reason that is, is because it is saying that I don't need God. I can be my own God and create life in a way that I want. The enemy is behind this way of thinking and his motive is to get you to use your time in a way that is opposite to God's perfect timing and opposed to God's will and purpose. It's no wonder then that we battle in life so much and we lose hope. Another important question to ask yourself is, am I operating on God's time or my time? God's timing is perfect because it allows us the time we need to do all that we need to do to arrive at his perfect will for our lives. Jesus had advice on how to practically do this. Many of his parables had the underlying lesson of preparedness. Be sure you are ready for no one knows the time when God will usher in the end of time as we know it bringing about Christ's return. Only by making God the focus and total priority of your time on this earth will you succeed. His ways are the only way you can make the most of the precious time God has given you. God has given you also the secrets of living a fulfilled life. Teaching on this in Matthew 6, 33 to 34, Jesus said, But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
God knows that there are many other necessary parts to life that demand your attention. He just wants you to keep him the focus and allow him to guide you in all things. Your needs will be met. You will survive the hard and impossible times. You will experience joy again. The God who is in charge of time will see you through and supply all your needs. It may be hard, you might be afraid and worry about it, but keep your eyes on Jesus, not on the clock in front of your face. In verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The God who created time, who created you in time, wants you to be assured that he has you in his hands. Just start with today. Take it a day at a time because he's got all your tomorrows and more importantly, your forevermore. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you created time, that you are the giver of time, Lord, and that the purpose in giving us time, Lord, was that we might be saved, restored in relationship with you, Lord, and come to live a life that is full, rooted in your ways, Lord, guided by your hand. Thank you for that incredible blessing. Lord, as we leave today, and go about the rest of our day, I pray that these lessons we have learned would be instilled in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, to operate in your time and not in our time. Help us to grow in patience, Lord, as we wait for you. Wait for your perfect timing, knowing in full confidence that you have all good things in store for us and that you work all things into a beautiful picture, a picture that represents your purpose and will for this world. We love you, Lord. Have your way in our lives, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.